It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the Lenore Rhines Athletic Trainers Professor Michael Flicker. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Brandon. Thanks for having me on board. Thank you. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to work in education and work with the athletic trainers? You know, I think, I think for me, it came as part of my obligation to the profession, right? I I love sports. I like medicine. They work together. I, being an athletic trainer, I got to do to be around sports, be on the sidelines, and then to tell people how great it is versus show them or teach them skills as a preceptor or, you know, uh, educating them cla- with their classwork. It's it's awesome to share your profession forward so it maintains and continues to grow. Of course, what was that experience like getting your bachelor's in athletic training from UNC? So my bachelor's is actually Temple. My master's is from Carolina. So we were we were an internship program back in the day when you could just do a bunch of hours and take a couple classes. So I got certified at Temple with that bachelor's degree. Uh, very fortunate from some of my mentors, Jerry Schwilly, who had previously worked with the Giants, was my head trainer. Uh, Ryan Kling, who went on to be a head trainer at Southern Illinois, Carbondale, and Moorhead State, uh, were two of my mentors right away. Uh, real fortunate with that. And then being at Carolina, I mean, Bill Prentice interviewed me to come be a student there. He was on the textbooks I used at Temple, right? So an author of a textbook, uh, he spoke my language. He loved sports. Uh, he had a successful run for a long time as a trainer with women's soccer at Carolina. So being around that level of success and the access I had to those high level teams at UNC really made me fall in love with what role I chose to take in life. Of course, at Temple, what was that experience like studying athletic training? So uh, I, I was fortunate, uh, like I said, with, with Jerry Schwilly, like the, my first couple of days as freshman, I walked in and held a door open for an older gentleman. Then he held one for me. Then I held one for him. And then all of a sudden we ended up at the same place. We were in an athletic training room. I was a freshman trying to get involved in the program early. And uh, I guess I showed him the right moxie for holding the door open for him and being respectful. And I got to get in there as a freshman instead of what's normal is a sophomore year. So my freshman year, I was taking a lot of sophomore level classes. So I had more time to practice it and I lived in a dorm with a bunch of football players and Mark Macon was on my floor and he was a great Temple basketball player. Uh, So I was around the athletes a lot. So even, even when I didn't know anything, the line behind me to tape was all of these great college athletes. And just because we had a good relationship outside of the athletic training room, I got to learn on real people sooner than I should have probably with my skill level being low. So it gave me a lot of confidence. And, you know, I think even, even my freshman year, the the experience that really, you know, it's my interview question when I hire staff, have you had your O moment, right? Have you had that bad moment where something really big's happened and you've maintained your composure and something went well? Well, I got mine, like my first spring ball, Uh, one of the safeties, the position group I was with, 
hurt his neck severely. And I, you know, I was the guy out there stabilizing his head because I was holding the water bottles at that group. And I just knew that's what you did. Right. And so like, I got my, oh crap moment out of the way right away. And after that, I got some great opportunities. I worked field hockey and we went to the NCAA tournament. I worked two years with John Chaney and that was just a pleasure and a blast. And I learned so much about you know, humans and how, how to do deal with people the right way. Uh, it just, it was an incredible experience working with all those different athletes. How was your experience like getting to go to UNC Chapel Hill to study sports medicine and get your master's? Oh, that was, you know, I, like I said, I've been, I was real fortunate in my young career, right? At, at Carolina, not only Dr. Prentice was teaching it from a textbook that I'd already used that had his name on it, uh, I worked field hockey, wrestling, and lacrosse, and those are some elite programs, right? Women's field hockey, we were in both Final Fours. Men's lacrosse, we were in both Final Fours. I worked wrestling and had a national champion wrestler, TJ Jaworski, under my care, right? So just the quality. They at, Back in those days, it was just eight to ten athletic trainers per class, first year and second year. So it was 16 up-and-coming professionals that have gone on to do amazing things all over the place, but the consistency of the faculty and athletic training staff, they were all there for years before and years after that just of being around a bunch of great people, you know, Chapel Hill's a great place, right? I, I tell a lot of people, it's some of my favorite two years of my life was the time I got to spend there. Just, you know, it's a place that people want to be because they do stuff the right way. Of course, after studying athletic training, at Carolina and Tipo, what was it like getting into teaching athletic training? So, yeah, so the teaching part is is really more for me about like giving people enough rope to hang themselves. You know what I mean? Like it's trial by fire, right? So, hey, I, I don't mind the students that work with me to try things and learn instead of just telling somebody how to make a cake, here's all the ingredients. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't, but you're there to guide them with it, right? So I think that's an important piece for learning is when you can make it your own. And I've always done well by being actively involved in what's going on. So that's the kind of way I've tried to always teach people is, well, what do you think would work? And even if you disagree with the way that I get to a, a solution, I always, ask people to keep a little notebook. I call it their book of knowledge of like, hey, here's, Flick says do it this way, but I think I'd like to do it this way when I got to make my own decisions. And I don't, there's a lot of ways you can get to the right answer in athletic training, right? In physics or science, there's like one way, right? Use this formula, here's the answer. In athletic training, sometimes it comes down to the student athlete's willingness to get in here and do the work or the time schedule they have with class might affect what you can do with them or their level on the team, right? A starter, you might have, they might have to play more hurt than the guy that's just a roster person near closer to the bottom of the roster that doesn't play a lot. So you have to deal with people's personalities more. So that takes a lot of trial and error. So that's probably the other piece I try and focus on when I'm teaching is you can tell anybody anything if you're an effective communicator and the student athlete trusts you. So an example of that for me to my students is, okay, you watch me in the training room. I always joke with people and I know something about them outside of their number and their position in their sport, right? So when somebody might get hurt, especially in an in-game thing, if I come out there and be serious and nervous, that's not who they're used to seeing. So even if I think an injury is really severe, I'll go out there and tell a joke and the kid can relax because they know that I'm just me and I'm somebody they trust. And they know that if I'm relaxed, that they can maybe be a little more relaxed, even if something really big's going on, because I'm true to myself and who they expect me to be. Of course, what is your experience like getting to teach those perf those students on how to become athletic trainers in the future? Yeah, I think so. Athletic training's changed a lot in the last couple of years, and mostly for the better. Uh, some of the education pieces are different than, than when I did it 30 years ago, but so is uh, technology and a lot of other things, right? So, you know, I didn't used to have glasses on to be able to see myself on a screen uh, anyway, or even have a screen, right? Like, so this is different for me, but 
the things that changed to me is with it being an entry levels master's program, it's even more important that they pick up the skills faster. I spoke earlier how I had, I was fortunate. I had four years at Temple of being in the athletic training room and then two years for my master's degree as a certified athletic trainer. Now you can't get certified until you take an entry level master's program. So you're not certified till you're coming out and you really probably only have two years of experience while cramming four years of undergrad coursework into two years of grad school. So the academic concentration is quicker and your hours and experience and just time with boots on the ground isn't as much. So it really changes how you have to learn. You have to be willing to uh, think faster, react quicker, or have good mentors available to call when you're at your first job because you're still learning on the fly because now it's the first time you ever get to make your own decision. Whereas in grad school, I got to make every decision on my own because I was already certified. Now with the students under me, I try and give them that freedom to make decisions, but still, you know, your requirement is to be auditory, visual, listening to all of those decisions to just intervene on behalf of the student athlete if somebody's headed down the wrong path. But it's really about giving them space to make a decision. Was for those students looking to get into athletic training, what are some of the classes they need to take? Well, the, the first thing I, I think everybody should take is a basic anatomy physiology course right? And kinesiology, understanding how the body works makes it a lot easier for the eval. Brandon, if you came to me and said, hey, my elbow hurts. And I said, where? And then you told, and then I said, why? What happened? Just understanding the mechanics of the elbow helped me narrow it down to a couple of things right off the bat. Then asking what your current function is, when does it bother you? Like that helps a lot. So those pieces are all important. Then obviously you're going to get into classes where you evaluate joints. You're going to evaluate them. You're going to refer, figure out what is an automatic referral. Like, hey, that looks like a fracture that has to go. Hey, that shoulder was dislocated. That has to go, you know, learning those things. And then the rehab techniques are especially important, right? Like I, I joke with people now because some young professionals, they want to nail every evaluation. They want to get the right answer on the eval. And me being a 54-year-old veteran, I, I'm more worried about what their function is, right? Like if their shoulder's causing them pain and I strengthen it and I make sure they have full range of motion, they're aware of where it is in space and they can protect themselves, they can probably play whether I diagnose that as bursitis, tendonitis, or a minor shoulder strain, right? Like the answer is the same, right? I need them to be strong enough to participate in their sport. If they're not safe or they're not progressing, you know, I might I might send them to the doctor later to validate my evaluation. I'm, I'm more concerned about if they're safe and can perform. Of course, what is it like, obviously, seeing those athletic future athletic trainers taking those classes like sports for performance nutrition? But, you know, that that's a piece. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for bringing that up with these courses that I'm listing. Right. Uh, Nutrition and sleep are huge. The NCAs had huge focus on that the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we're always learning. I, I even just read a book recently for some of my continuing edu education credits, uh, nutrition timing, right? Like I could eat the right stuff in the wrong order and it's not as effective for me for recovery, right? You want that protein carbohydrate right after your workout, uh, you know, and you get your fats in later to balance out your diet, but they're not the ideal thing right when you walk out of the weight room. So Every, every course is important. I, I trust practical knowledge too, right? Like, like there's, there's all these reliability, validity quotients around all these tests or all these treatments. Sometimes I use the gut test, right? Or the eyeball test, like, Hey, let's try something new here, right? Like it used to be isomuscle. I used to be an ice the muscle after, um, if you have a mild strain, I used to ice it after practice and freeze it up, right? And then I had a year where my whole secondary had hamstring or quad stuff. And after every practice, I was icing it and nobody was progressing. So one week I just threw caution to the wind. I said, hey, we're going to ice, we're going to heat it before, we're going to stretch it, we're going to practice, and then we're going to heat it after because we're, we're cutting off the blood supply to the muscle. Let's stop doing that 
and everybody got better a lot quicker. So now, even though it's probably a little bit outside the box of what more, most people do normally, that's what I like to do because that's in my book of knowledge that let's just heat stuff after so we can keep blood in the area so it doesn't get tight and stiff and we're starting from the same point every day. Let's keep getting it a little bit looser every day so we can heal. So I, I, I do let, I do want to try and teach my athletic training students to, to learn on the fly and, and go with what works for them. Of course, as a professor, what is that experience like getting to see them get that real world in action experience? Oh, as a precept, there's nothing as rewarding as when the light bulb clicks on on something or you know, like they're they're in class and they're learning what an ACL test is and they're doing the Lockman and they're doing the drawer, but they're doing it on somebody whose ACL is intact. And then unfortunately we get an injury and they get to feel it for real. And like the look in their eye when they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, yeah. I can feel the difference from what I've been learning in class. I can see that this is an issue. I understand now, right? Like the light bulb going on for anything rehab, even like when it's sim something simple as taping, right? Like I had, four, I, I had a long line of people behind me while I was being a hack taper. I'm a very proficient taper now, but I had a long time to get better at it. These students have two years to learn how to be a decent taper, right? So when they, when you teach them a, just a technique, they're so thankful and, and proud of themselves and, and they deserve to be right. Cause they're learning in two years, what I learned in six. So they, they're in an accelerated rate. So whatever we can do in here to help them is great. Of course, what career options are there out there for students that are studying athletic training after studying? It's so, it's so much broader now than it used to be, right? Like my, when I got out of Carolina, it was like, go work at a high school, which I did for a little while before I came to Lenore Ryan, or go work at a collegiate setting, right? That, that was probably it. Then it continued to grow, right? Industrial athletic training, you know, military has employed a lot of athletic trainers recently. Middle schools are starting to do it now instead of just high schools. Uh, the YMCA, bigger YMCAs have it. Uh, it's just everywhere, right? Some Somebody that understands the body who can prevent, limit injuries or help you return from one, right? So how does it work in industry, right? They're all doing repetitive jobs. So their posture is going to get bad. It's just like specializing in a sport as a kid. If you only throw fastballs all the time, your right arm is going to be way bigger than your left. So you're not going to be real good at something else. So you, you know, to teach body mechanics or stretching or when to take a proper break or how to protect your back while you're standing for your eight hour shift or what shoes to wear or any of those pieces, like that's how we can help an industry. But those things apply just the same for my right fielder or my, you know, goalie at soccer, right? Like how do we magnify their athleticism while limiting injuries? It, it translates everywhere. Of course, as a professor, what is it like getting to see those athletic trainer students go on and getting jobs, whether it's in the military or whether it's in professional sports or even college sports? It, it's always very satisfying. The ones, the ones that, you know, reach back out and say, hey, thanks, or even like, hey, they trust you enough for you to be a mentor for them while they're at their first job, right? The first year they call quite regularly and then it gets they get more comfortable with the profession. It's always great to hear from them, see them, or, you know, like we have a lot of students here from at right now, as our program has gone away over the last couple of years here. We see a lot from app or Western. They come through and they're like, hey, you had this person and she says to tell you hi and thanks and those things. It's just rewarding to help move the profession forward. I know that that those schools are making quality athletic trainers, and it's just nice to be part of the process to keep refilling the profession. It's real fortunate timing right now for athletic training. There's there's a lot of positions opening so and open, so they usually land somewhere that they want to land. Of course, what are some of your future plans in being a professor for athletic training? So, you know, I just hope that people keep letting me be a preceptor, right? I feel like I have useful information to share. Uh, I joke that uh, with people that I'm going to die at my desk in, at Lenore Ryan, right? Like I love the, the things that Lenore Ryan lets me do. 
in terms of being involved in the athletic department with the student athletes. So I hope to get to keep doing that and, and teaching is teaching and, and having people learn are some of my favorite things. Like we'll, we, we probably have three or four high school interns here where they want to come figure out if athletic training is something they want to do in the future. I'm talking to somebody on Wednesday that wants to just spend a year with us learning, right, in, in between their bachelor's and their master's to see if the field's right for them. I just want to give people an opportunity to figure out who they want to be in the world, and I think athletic training is a great thing, and I'm happy to share with them what I know. What advice for you with those people that are looking to study in athletic training? So I, I think I think I'd start with communication, right? Are you an effective communicator? Uh, it, it, it pretty much all boils down to that. Trust, relationships, uh, expectations, accountability, all comes down to communication. Once you get past communication, you have to love uh serving people right because it's a servant it's a servant job right like hey i need this hey will you look at this hey will you do this for me hey we practice from four to six today and five to seven tomorrow can you be here you know like understand that other people are going to control your schedule some of it's the league when they schedule games some of it's your coaches some of it's your students classes are going to affect when you're available and can help them but you have to have a caring service towards others kind of uh mindset as well as the communication the intelligent classroom part that really to me is like third right like it's important to be smart and be creative and be able to be solution oriented but you don't like that isn't like like to be a brain surgeon or work for nasa you probably have to have a really intelligent skill level in math right i think if you can talk to somebody and you care about them you can do enough of the rest to lead somebody to success as an athletic trainer. What advice would you give those students that are looking to become athletic trainers on the college level or even professional level? So it, I, I think that's all networking, right? Like when you get out, when you get out with your degree, there's plenty of college jobs available, right? Take the right one for you where you're going to learn and grow, diversify your resume, apply for those internships, over the summer for baseball or over the winter and spring for football, right? Get your foot in the door, meet people. And I was talking with our women's soccer coach the other day, his graduate assistant is going to go do a bunch of camps this summer. So she can meet a lot of different coaches and show how great she is to other people. It's the same thing in athletic training, do your job, do it well, uh, and, and work, work well with others and be around other people, right? If you just go, go back to your local high school where you grew up and you're just with one athletic trainer, it's going to be hard to market yourself. But if you go to somewhere where they have a staff that's from all over the place, then all of those people have 10 people that they know. And if you do a good job for them, they're happy to call one of those 10 people when that job comes open. It's a, it's a who, you know, sometimes, and you have to be quality at your job, but once you get in a network and you get in, you get in that like streamline ride to the top kind of a deal. What advice would you give those people that are looking to work in sports education, in particular in athletic training? So I, it, it's the same thing, right? It's it's get, get good at what you need to be good at, right? So education, communication is still on the list, right? Uh, you might have a little bit more control of your schedule in athletic tr training, education than you do athletic training working with the team because your class is going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 to 11, right? And so that's going to be pretty solidly locked in. You're in charge of when your class is, but I still think it's the same love and care for just a different group, right? You're teaching people how to do things that care for others, but you still have to have the communication. You still have to have the caring piece, and you probably need to be a little smarter. I, I am... I will say this, I'm certified, right? So like, I'm never afraid to say, hey, let's double check the book or now you can do it on Google, right? Like if a student challenges me and I'm wrong, I'm good with that now, right? I didn't used to be, but I'm good with that now. There's a lot of stuff in my brain and not all of it's stuck for 30 years. So be, be humble enough to admit when somebody got something on you that you didn't get right, but you don't have to know it all. You just have to know how to react in those emergency situations. 
other than that, you can go look it up and find out what's best. I worked with two patients today that I used my book to figure out what their next exercise was going to be because I felt like they needed a new challenge. So never be afraid to continue to learn. That's great advice. Where can my listeners find you out on social media? Actually, I have a lot of big opinions, so I'm a, not a big social media guy. So if anybody wants to ask me anything, just shoot me an email. I'm flickerm at lr.edu. Uh, I, I just find I lose so much time on social media that I just stop doing it. Thank you again, Michael Flicker, for your interview, and best of luck in your future as the assistant athletic training professor. Hey, thank you. Appreciate you, Brandon. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon. You can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.